So our next speaker is uh, Josh Kumi. Uh, I just talked to Josh before the, uh, before the session. His background is actually in forest ecology. And before joining Sam Hazen's lab at UMass Amherst, uh, he was, uh, if I understand correctly, designing controlled burns to manage uh, uh, forest populations and the Pine Barrens. Um, so he brings a very broad background in, in plant biology, obviously, to this, uh, to this endeavor. When, when he got involved with, with Sam, he wanted to bring a more molecular focus to his work. And uh, he's been working in uh, Sam Hazen's lab, which is, as those of you who were here last year at the, at the user meeting know, is involved in really understanding the fundamentals of how the cell wall and plant is, is built and how it's, how it's metabolized and, and controlled. And so Josh has been working um, in Sam's lab, doing a very exciting project, developing a multifunctional library of grass transcription factors, and then using them to read, uh, uh, using Brachypodium as a way of reading out the impact of these transcription factors on the developmental biology of the plant cell wall. So it's exciting to have uh, Josh here to speak to us today about this work. Um, take, it, take it away, Josh. Thanks. Uh Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you very much to the JGI for inviting me to speak with you here today. Um, so, yeah, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work that um, my group uh, in the Hazen Lab at UMass Amherst, uh, in conjunction with uh, the Mockler Group at the Danforth Center, is doing with the, uh, the help and collaboration of Dr. Sam Deutsch's group here at the JGI, in creating a very nice uh, genetic tool for studying transcriptional regulation in the model system Brachypodium stachyon. So uh, to get started, a little bit about the interest of our group, um, primarily in understanding the mechanisms that regulate growth in grasses. Uh, so we watch grass grow. It's very exciting. Um, it is very exciting. So um, essentially, uh, what, what our growth boils down to for us is the acquisition of biomass through the accumulation of cell wall material. And uh, in grasses, the secondary cell wall um, is where the most material is deposited. Um, with the sort of a general composition being of cellulose, hemicelluloses, and lignans. Um, the celluloses are, are arrayed in a, a matrix that's, that's locked with um, hemicelluloses and lignans, um, which can be used, um, as we've all heard about, as a source for uh, biomass or biofuel production. So we want to understand the mechanisms that regulate this growth. Um, so energy crops, as we just heard a very nice talk about miscanthus, um, major energy crops including miscanthus, uh, switchgrass and sorghum are sort of the, the application of where our research uh, would go. Um, however, these are not very tractable systems for, for us to work in our, our lab in Massachusetts. Um, Miscanthus being the sterile triploid, um, switchgrass, an obligate outcrossing, uh, tetraploid or octoploid, and sorghum, which is gigantic. Uh, so these are, are difficult systems for us to work with. But if we zoom in here, um, so my PI is Sun, and he's holding our favorite grass uh, in his hand, a very small grass which is Brachypodium nystachyon. Uh, so Brachypodium is one of the JGI's uh, seven flagship genome species. Uh, it's a very nice model system. Um, it shares many characteristics with the classic model plant, Arabidopsis, um, in small stature, short lifetime. Uh, the JGI has done a very nice job finishing off the genome for Brachypodium and is currently doing a, a resequencing of 60 accessions to really give a nice tool there. Um, it's easily transformable through agrobacterium, media transformation, um, relatively easy through, through cation induction. Um, and importantly for our purposes, it's more closely related to the major cereal and energy crops um, than Arabidopsis is. So we hope that the discoveries we make in Brachypodium can be more easily translated to those actual crop species. So in understanding the, the deposition of cell wall, um, it, the, this system is best worked out in Arabidopsis. Uh, it's been worked on for a number of years, um, and we've seen there's a, a hierarchy of feed-forward loops involving a variety of transcription factors that initiate cascades um, and also interact directly with cell wall biosynthetic genes to control the deposition of the cell wall polymers. So in Arabidopsis, as a DICOP model, this is fairly well established. However, in the monocots and the grasses, we don't have the same level of resolution. Um, what we do understand is sort of spread across several species and it's not as well parsed out. So our lab is really interested in, in filling out this model um, to the extent of, or greater than, Arabidopsis. So uh, another uh, example of how well-defined the Arabidopsis model is, um, is shown in this example, where again we have cell wall biosynthetic genes down at the bottom, and a tiered network of, of really detailed interactions of transcription factors above. And this sort of level of resolution is, is possible because of the large genetic resources available for Arabidopsis. 
Um, an open reading frame library of over 2,000 open reading frames is available. Um, and this is part of a, a long-standing effort of many groups, such as SOC, Recon, K, um, who put together this large-scale library. Um, but despite this large-scale effort, there's still about 200 predicted uh, DNA binding genes that have not been captured and included in these collections. Um, so much like the, the efforts to, to raise the sequence quality of Brachypodium and other plant species to the level of the classic model Arabidopsis, we really want to take um, Brachypodium's open reading frame library and enrich it and elevate it to the level so we can have the same sort of detailed study in grasses. So to do this, uh, we're creating uh, the Brachypodium Dostachyon Transcription Factor Open Reading Frame Library, uh, which we, Brady Torfel is our nickname for it. And we're doing this in conjunction with Sam Deutsch's group here at the, the JGI, the Synthetic Biology Division. Um, and the sort of the interesting tact we're taking here is rather than doing traditional cloning, we're actually using gene synthesis to capture these full-length cDNAs. And we hope that this will help alleviate some of the problems of getting at those more to, difficult to clone um, open reading frames. So as it stands currently, our, our library has about 300 open reading frames that are, have about half of them in hand and half are continuing to be synthesized, um, representing about 500,000 base pairs of, of gene material. Um, and we selected these open reading frames primarily based on the interest of, of our group at the Hazen Lab and uh, also our collaborators, basing them on uh, biomass feedstock relevant traits, so growth, um, cell wall deposition, and some abiotic stress tolerance. Um, and also our, part of our selection process involved, oops, I have turned off the presentation, All right. um, the annotation as transcription factors from the genome, um, and also we really wanted to find those open reading frames that are not present in other current collections that are growing. Um, so our, our library is, is, has a, a variety of transcription factor families related to these traits that we're interested in. Um, and the, we really want to create a multifunctional library, so the, the downstream applications of this are many, the synthesized genes are delivered in an entry vector format that can be compatible with many other gateway compatible downstream vectors um, for a variety of applications. Uh, protein DNA interactions, protein protein interactions, for finding those interesting um, candidate proteins to study further, and also overexpression in plants through gain of function um, and then dominant overexpression and dominant repression. So, a, a brief overview of, of how genes are synthesized. Um, as you heard, I'm, I'm not a synthetic biologist by trade, so I've learned a lot about this process as I've been working in the Hazen lab here. But essentially what uh, the JGI can do is uh, a target open reading frame uh, up to about 5 kb can be subdivided into 1 kb parts. Uh, and those parts are assembled via this polymerase chain assembly, which essentially uses a pool of oligos that represent the 1 kb part that are, are annealed and extended until you have the desired construct, which can be PCR amplified. Um, those 1 kb parts are propagated through an E. coli system, and then the, KB, the, the, the smaller parts can be assembled into the full open reading frame through Gibson assembly, where uh, a 5 prime exonuclease is used to chew back one end of the, the strand and create sticky ends, which anneal um, and are sealed with a polymerase and ligase. And so those assembled parts are then delivered to us in an entry clone that we can use for any of our downstream interests. So as we went forward with the first round of synthesis of this library, um, we learned a lot about what it, the uh, difficulties of synthesizing genes from Brachypodium are. Um, so you can see here in these figures, we have uh, representations of the, the three major problems we ran into, which were um, small sequence repeats, so max occurrence of the same trimer in the open reading frame, uh, the total sequence GC content, as well as the, the localized maximum GC content in any 100 base pair sliding window across the sequence. Um, so you can see here the, the blue bars denote successful synthesis, whereas the red show those sequences that we weren't able to capture the first time around. So uh, these issues that arose the first round of synthesis really taught us a lot, and we were able to apply those in our second round of synthesis. So as we, we went back and looked at the, the problems we had the first time around, we established some thresholds for characterizing the risk associated with synthesizing various open reading frames. So those being, as you can see from the previous slide, uh, a sequence total GC content above 65%, the, the localized sliding base pair window of um, over 75%, and then a maximum trimer recurrence of more than 45 trimers in any given sequence. Um, and the, these red flags we use to sort of rank the risk associated with the open reading frames we're interested in capturing. Um, so zero being they were, they were perfectly well behaved, no problems, and then increasing levels of risk were associated with 
uh, one or more of these red flags being found in those sequences. Um, and for those really difficult ones, the, the ranked four or five having two or, or more of these issues uh, in the sequence, we actually chose to look at codon optimizing those sequences to make them more amenable for synthesis. So as we all heard about the other day with uh, codon usage, um, synonymous codons can really make it capable for us to, to manipulate these sequences to make them more amenable for synthesis. synthesis. Uh, Brachypodium as a genome does tend to have a bias towards using codons that end in Gs and Cs. Um, so these synonymous codons really make it useful for us to, to break up those areas of an open reading frame that have either sequence repeats or have high GC contents globally or locally within the sequence. Um, so we've been working uh, very closely with Sam Deutsch's group to determine uh, how and when to use these codon optimized sequences. Um, and essentially we'll, the, the ones we have selected will be used primarily for determining interactions in, in systems like yeast, so protein, protein, or protein DNA interactions. And then for implant expression, we're really probably gonna to wanna to go back and clone out the native sequence if possible. So that will be, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So now I have a little bit of, of, of functional data to show you, so we're very excited about this. Um, our, our primary application of the library as it stands right now is to doing yeast one hybrids to identify interesting candidates for protein DNA interactions. Um, so just a, a brief overview of our one hybrid system. We use uh, the, the interesting, the, the DNA sequence of interest is in control of a reporter gene. In our case, it's this renal luciferase. Um, and this reporter construct is integrated into yeast to create reporter strains. The transcription factor being tested is transferred into a vector where it's expressed, uh, fused to a GAL4 activation domain so that when if and when these, this transcription factor interacts with our DNA sequence of interest, we uh, initiate transcription of luciferase, which we can quantify in a plate reader or visualize in a gel box as, as light. So back to our, our, our wall regulatory network. Um, for me, uh, as a graduate student, I'm interested in the ortholog of this protein, NAT7, and Arabidopsis, which is shown to interact with some lignin genes. Um, so it's ortholog and brachypodium. We also have some evidence in yeast of it being interacting with lignin genes. So I, I use this um, to, to do our first screen of our synthetic library to look upstream of this gene and see what, what could be binding to the promoter region and controlling that gene expression. So I, I cloned the one KB promoter of the, the HB protein. Um, it's a homeobox domain protein um, in three fragments that overlap and screened this first fragment here against our, our new synthetic library. And we got some interesting hits that were uh, significant above a two standard deviation threshold. Uh, particularly, there's uh, the most interesting, uh, most intensive interaction was uh, with a protein containing a, a FAR1 domain, which is involved in, in light sensing. There was also uh, a G3, GH3 oxygen responsive element that interacted, as well as this um, brachypodium ortholog of the Arabidopsis cycling DOF 1E factor, which is involved in the circadian regulation of flowering time also involved um, in the perception of light. So two, two genes interested in, uh, involved in light signaling pathways and one growth-related hormone. Um, so we were very excited about this um, as a first run. This is, very, this is very preliminary, hot off the plate reader data um, of our synthetic library being screened against one of our genes of interest and finding some fairly interesting interactions. So I look forward to going back to lab and confirming this data and, and characterizing it further in plants. The other uh, approach that we take um, to this sort of, so the, the previous uh, example was a, a gene-centric screening approach where we take a gene of interest and look at its promoter. Um, the Mockler group at the Danforth Center is also using this library in a, a protein-centric approach, wherein they take uh, one transcription factor and screen it against a library they've created of synthetic promoters that represent a combinatorial uh, array of all the various eight nucleotide binding motifs. So in, in their system, they can screen this one interrogate one protein against a variety of, of, of binding motifs um, and determine what the consensus sequence for that protein can be. So this is an example here of um, uh, an ortholog of the evening element from Arabidopsis um, in their library screen. So we can really take a two-pronged approach to this, looking at proteins that interact with specific DNA sequences and then also, also interrogating how those uh, the specific sequences, motifs within those sequences, the proteins bind. So we're really, really very excited about this um, and the power of this library to really find some interesting interactions here as we move further with elucidating this regulatory network in grasses. 
Um, so with that, I'd like to, to thank all the groups involved. Um, my group uh, in the Hazen Lab at UMass Amherst, um, the Mockler Group at Danforth Center, of course, Sam Deutsch's group here at the JGI, without whom we couldn't have this library in the first place, um, the K Group at uh, University of California, and also uh, Siobhan Brady's group at Davis. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Time for some questions. So when you, when you make these, um, these synthetic promoters, what is your sort of success rate? How often does, does, some, does a synthetic promoter that you, that you predict is going to work, how often does it actually work? Or is that, is that not even a well-defined question at this point? Um, so, so the synthetic promoters, is, is, that's primarily the, the Mockbus group at the Danforth Center, so I'm not too involved with that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they, they do an array of all various combinations of the enucleotide binding domains. So usually they, they do it in a three to four well plate format, so there's a lot, a lot of things to screen against. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it varies. Um, so by looking at the different interactions that they do find, they can sort of put together a, a common motif that's in all those sequences. Um, so as far as the actual success rate, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Josh? It's all really very exciting, that this, this movement of the JGI into synthetic biology. It's it really, as, as we heard in the, from June Medford's talk at the beginning, being able to manipulate things rather than just describe them is an essential part of being able to make the next step, the next leap forward into using the data that we've generated. And so, I applaud Josh and his collaborators for making these, making these uh, efforts. Thanks, Josh.